Our guest on this edition of the Geopolitics and Empire podcast is Jason Ross, who is a science advisor at the Schiller Institute. We will be discussing the imperial ambitions of China in Africa and beyond. Don't forget to subscribe to all of our channels and social media, as well as leave us a tip via Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin. And now on to the interview. It's great to have you on the podcast, Jason. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the tweet that you have pinned on your Twitter, which is quoting a Chinese ambassador and says, quote, they want to keep Africa as it was, poor and divided, to be controlled by others. What they worry about is Africa's realization of economic independence with China support. What they worry about is a strong Africa, end quote. I assume they is the West and or the Anglo-American establishment, which includes the EU. So can you talk a little bit about whether China is a new hegemonic empire and whether what China is doing in Africa, Latin America and beyond is empire building? Mm. Well, that that quote is from uh, the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador to South Africa. And he made that statement shortly after Rex Tillerson's trip to Africa about a, about a half a year ago, where Tillerson had warned countries in Africa to beware of Chinese influence and to beware of China pulling people into debt traps or into, uh, you know, into political alliances that they would not be for their benefit. At the time that he said that, he was making the point, the Chinese ambassador was making the point that Chinese aid, excuse me, Chinese finance into Africa is something that Chinese nations have been seeking of their own free will. Chinese countries have, excuse me, African countries have programs that they want to adopt. They have infrastructure goals, they have trade goals, they have energy goals. And these nations are looking for partners around the world that they can work with. They're looking to the World Bank. They're looking to the United States. They're looking to the African Development Bank. They're looking to China. They're looking all around. And one of the lines that we're hearing so frequently now from European and some American institutions is that China is building up a new empire, that this is a new form of colonialism, that China is taking over Africa with a debt trap and through entangling alliances, and that this is not to the benefit of these African nations. That statement is simply untrue. Most African debt is held by Western institutions. It's certainly not held by China. And as the chart that I've got in that pinned tweet that you had mentioned shows, the investment made by, for example, Chinese foreign direct investment into Africa compared to U.S. is much more focused on construction, on manufacturing, on technology compared to the investment, the U.S. FDI in Africa, which is much more focused on mining as is typical also for uh, England or for France. So it's a bit of an irony to hear the former colonizers of Africa, the French and the British most particularly, complaining that what China is doing is a new colonialism. I think it's historically inaccurate, and frankly, it's very offensive to the victims and what was done under true colonialism in the 19th century and in the 20th century in Africa. And that's a view that many African leaders adopt as well. Many of them are insulted by the idea that they say, okay, perhaps China is pushing some you know, tough bargaining with us. But to compare this to the murder of our leaders, the military occupation of our nations, the redrawing of borders, it's just not even a comparison. And so let's look at some of the positive aspects then of the new Silk Road, the Belt and Road, what was initially called the One Belt, One Road. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here now in Kazakhstan and Central Asia. So the Belt Road, I believe was, if I'm not mistaken, first announced in Kazakhstan. Um, Correct. But, uh -huh. and so, you know, there, it's going through Central Asia they're link going through the the Caucasus and the the Caspian, linking all the way to Europe, um, through the Middle East, through India, Pakistan, the maritime routes, the Arctic routes, Africa, Latin America. So, could you give, um, you know, you've sp spoken on the, about the forum on China Africa cooperation, and 
you know, t- can you give us some positive achievements of China in the Belt and Road? Because especially in Africa, they seem to be building roads, infrastructure, ports, schools, hospitals, as opposed to the Bretton Woods system in the West, who have been either blowing up entire countries through war or saddling them uh, with debt through the IMF and the World Bank. Sure. Well, one of the things to keep in mind about the FOCAC, so the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, this is a, a forum for discussion that was started in the year 2000 and has meetings held every three years, moving back and forth between China and nations in Africa. In 2015, the conference was held in Johannesburg, South Africa. This year, it was held in Beijing, China. And in 2021, it's going to be held in Senegal. Senegal is now the chair of the the FOCAC for the next uh, three years through that event. Both in 2015 and in 2018, Chinese announcements were made of support for financing on the level of about $60 billion. In 2015, it was very directly government uh, financing through, and this takes various forms. Some of this is grants, some of this is concessional loans, some of this is loans through the Export Import Bank at more market rates. It's a variety of, of types of financing. And in the 2018 FOCAC, the number 60 billion again was repeated, although 10 billion of it is more directed towards an idea that Chinese private firms will invest $10 billion in Africa. But regardless, this is a substantial sum of money, and the specific projects that we're seeing this going into are, on the one side, very large projects that people are probably maybe more familiar with, such as the rail line built between Djibouti and Addis Ababa, which helps dramatically reduce the travel time between those two cities. The idea, of course, is to upgrade this rail line to include freight transport as well. And currently, it's only for passenger transport, and railroads, certainly like this, need freight transport um, to really achieve their full economic benefits. The other major example would be the rail line built in Kenya, from Mombasa to Nairobi, with the intent of extending it into Uganda, as well as then coming around into um, Rwanda and Burundi. This is another project where Kenya was seeking financing. This had been on the books as a, as a Kenyan ambition for some time, and they worked out an arrangement with the Export-Import Bank of China and Chinese rail construction to get the project um, completed. Other smaller projects are things along the lines of health programs, um, manufacturing, Chinese corporations setting up manufacturing facilities in Africa, both to take advantage of trade deals and also, of course, to provide products for the growing consumer market in Africa. Um, overall, the way African leaders have expressed this, especially in regard to the claims that this is a debt trap, I'll just read a couple of quotes. Uh, one is uh, Jude Moore, who is the former Liberian Minister of Public Works, and he says that claims that China is trapping Africans in debt He says, quote, this almost infantilizes Africans and African leaders. He says that it's almost as if African countries are naive or if they don't understand what is happening to them. And China is basically pulling the wool over their eyes. This is the implication of people who say that Africans are being trapped into debt. Other speakers recently in the past half year, the president of Nigeria, President Buhari, has said that this is not a debt trap. Nigeria is eager to engage in projects, and if financing is available from China, then that's wonderful. The president of the African Development Bank has said that Africa does not have a continent-wide debt crisis. I mentioned Nigeria. This is another nation where a Chinese rail firm has got the contracts to build high-speed rail um, up from uh, up from Lagos up to the north, eventually to join with the Trans-African Highway or the Trans-Sahelian Railroad going from Dakar. Senegal to N'Djamena, Chad. So there's a lot of of specific development projects that are moving forward. And in comparison with some of the Bretton Woods institutions, there's a couple of differences. One is the ease of working with Chinese lenders, uh, be it private companies getting financing through the state or through the Chinese Export-Import Bank, etc. One is that the time frame is much easier. 
the time from proposal of a project to getting the loans and getting the shovels in the ground and things moving, it, it might take only a year or less when dealing with the Chinese, whereas when working through the World Bank, you're probably going to be spending three years on the paperwork and the discussion before anything starts getting built. The other major aspect is how tied in development assistance, development financing is with political demands or what I would say, frankly, are ideological economic demands coming from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. For example, the World Bank will not finance coal power plants in any but the most poor of countries on this planet. The World Bank simply will say, we will not do this. This is not carbon friendly. We will not help you develop in this respect. Whereas the Chinese Export-Import Bank is, it doesn't have that kind of hang-up. Say, so you need power, this is a very inexpensive form of power, sure, we'll provide the financing. Uh, also, another example, if I may, is the, the Grand Inga Dam Complex in the DRC, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has got a location where the vast flow of the Congo River, combined with a very significant and rapid drop in elevation, there's the potential for up to 40,000 megawatts of hydroelectric power in this region. It's a project that the World Bank was interested in, but eventually pulled out of. And then just, I believe, in the past couple of weeks, a Spanish and Chinese consortium of companies has signed a deal with the DRC to move forward on this project on the scale of a 10,000 megawatt hydro plant, which is an enormous, enormous amount of power, particularly in the DRC, which is one of the most energy poor countries on this planet. This is going to have a tremendous beneficial impact. And I think that the writing is somewhat on the wall. Countries looking to develop, they find where they can get that financing from. And right now, frequently, it's not coming from the World Bank or the IMF. It may come from the Chinese Export-Import Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or some of the other um, types of funds or regional development organizations that, for example, are financing the aspects of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Let's hold that thought on Bretton Woods because I wanted to get a little deeper into that. But before we talk about that, I just had one more question regarding the Belt and Road projects uh you know no human being is perfect no country is perfect there you know there's the good stuff and bad stuff you know america's got good stuff and bad stuff china as well but um what could be for you what you've seen and what you've researched any negative aspects of china's uh interests i mean there must be some i recall reading the story of the chinese spying i believe on african embassies or maybe it's uh, in some of the infrastructure projects or other projects, the quality uh, of the build. What are, are some potential negative aspects that you see? Hmm. Well, China certainly, as you said, like anybody, made its made its mistakes. And also, I think that some of the um, China's in an interesting situation in trying to defend themselves against claims that they're setting up a new empire. They present these projects to the West very much as a sort of, we're helping the world develop. This is, you know, for the benefit of Africans. This isn't, we're not being selfish here. At the same time, they have to explain to their own population why they're investing such large sums of money while there is still poverty, although much decreased uh, poverty in China. Yet poverty remains. And even though it's out of extreme poverty, of course, could have better living standards. And to that audience domestically, the idea of China acting charitably also doesn't um, isn't always what, what people uh, want to hear. Is China setting itself up for having future market access here, for getting on the ground early, for having a connection of its firms in the continent and developing a history that it'll, it'll be able to build on to have a very strong kind of um, dominance or, or major advantage in the continent? Of course, certainly, this is undoubtedly to the benefit of China, as well as to the benefit of African nations. I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind is that it really is possible to have deals where both sides benefit. Are the benefits even? Um, 
could African nations be stronger negotiators in the terms of some of these deals? I'm sure that they could. Um, regarding the uh, some aspects about construction quality, these are the kinds of things that China is having to improve, both domestically and the quality of its construction, in particular with concrete. I know they've had some um, very some poor experiences with with uh, concrete in the past. Another aspect is the use of Chinese labor. And early on, when China was, maybe let's say about a decade ago, five years ago, China was much more likely, Chinese firms were much more likely to employ Chinese labor, even in rather lower level positions, laboring type positions in these projects. Part of this came from an unfamiliarity with working internationally and just wanting to make sure that they could get the, the job done. It didn't look good, uh, of course, to see Chinese workers doing jobs that locals clearly could have been hired to do. And that's something that is, I'd say, something that China has definitely um, changed and learned from over the past five, ten years, where for the most part, um, most of the workers on these projects, we'd mentioned these rail projects, for example, most of the workers on these projects are African. It, it, it doesn't make sense for China to be bringing in a bunch of Chinese workers when there's local um, lo local people available to be involved in building the projects and then learning how to, to operate and run them. Regarding, you had asked about the Chinese spying. I believe that this was with regards to the uh, African Union headquarters located in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, which was a, a Chinese, the headquarters building was a Chinese project. I heard those allegations. I confess I didn't particularly follow up on them. So I'm not sure whether it was one of these things where we hear a story and hear a claim, and then maybe we don't recall whether it was followed up and, and demonstrated to be true. I believe that the report initially came from the, uh, it was either the French or the Germans, I believe the French, uh, who first were commenting on this, which again, I, I think sometimes that, you know, in looking at things in context, um, <laughs> given what the U.S. NSA does, for example, it's a little bit hard, even if China was doing this, which I don't believe was uh, was shown, or at least I haven't seen that. Um, you're putting things into context. Uh, I don't know if anyone on the planet is perfect, but the idea that China is setting up a colony and being a deleterious force in Africa, I don't think is, is supported uh, by some of these things. And getting so back to Bretton Woods, which I think is a big uh, theme, big topic, it's important. Uh, the world's financial and political structure essentially is built on the Bretton Woods uh, since the 1940s. And, you know, I, I see it, it, it was built by the Atlanticists, the US, the Europeans, the British, uh, who set up this system, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, um, the United Nations, and so forth. And we've previously interviewed the economic hitman, John Perkins, who basically explains how Bretton Woods is used as a sort of a vehicle. Um, and, you know, debt, it is a debt book diplomacy, which the, the U.S. and the Europeans have used through these institutions where they've given third world countries loans that intentionally they knew they couldn't pay back. And once these countries defaulted on these loans, um, these institutions would pick up the collateral, which were real assets, natural resources, industries in these foreign countries. Um, and so it seems like Bretton Woods is on its last legs, and we see China building a parallel system, you know, Russia included, Eurasia. Uh, they have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Asia Development Bank. Uh, they just recently um, opened the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which will allow uh, um, yuan to be used for payment for petroleum, the Euro Eurasian Union, and, and so on and so forth. So what's your take on the death of the Bretton Woods system, this uh, new system being built by China and whether there's you know a possibility for synergy because we've seen China added as a reserve currency uh, to the to the IMF uh, basket of currencies or w will there be conflict uh, will Bretton Woods you think disappear and be replaced by by China and basically will China be able to break the Mackinder model of geopolitics that has been played by the US and Europe for the last century well I think that that really is the central issue of our day. 
And it's one where the decision lies not purely in China's court, where China can do what China's doing, but this is a decision truly to be made by the Western nations, in particular by the United States. And through a collaboration between, let's say, the United States, Russia, China, and India, as proposed by the Schiller Institute, a new Bretton Woods conference could be held to right some of these wrongs and to address some of the compromises made in the initial Bretton Woods agreements. I think that it's important when looking at the reporting by John Perkins on how loans were used to create debt on purpose, that this has a rather specifically British type of pedigree. The financial empire still run from the city of London has as its basis financial power, the creation of financial arrangements, the control over financial institutions, such that today you know, London is a much larger center of world trade, excuse me, larger section of financial flows than Wall Street. If we look as the documentary The Spider's Web has shown at illegal money flows around the world, tax havens, these are all, almost all, British or supposedly former British uh, offshore locations. And I, I want to take this back to the dispute that took place at the creation of the original Bretton Woods in 1944. And in particular, at the difference in outlook between U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who during their meetings and discussions during the course of World War II, found that they had a uh, some significant areas of disagreement. I'd like to read a few paragraph quote from a book that was written by Elliot Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's son, who uh, accompanied his father to a number of these, these meetings with Churchill. So Roosevelt says to Churchill, quote, I am firmly of the belief that if we are to arrive at a stable peace, it must involve the development of backward countries, backward peoples. How can this be done? Well, it can't be done, obviously, by 18th century methods. Now, Churchill butts in. Who is talking 18th century methods, Churchill asks. Roosevelt responds, whichever of your ministers recommends a policy which takes wealth and raw materials out of a colonial country but which returns nothing to the people of that country in consideration. 20th century methods involve bringing industry to these colonies. 20th century methods include increasing the wealth of a people by increasing their standard of living, by educating them, by bringing them sanitation, by making sure that they get a return for the raw wealth of their community. Churchill says, you mentioned India, Roosevelt. Yes, I cannot believe that we can fight a war against fascist slavery and at the same time not work to free people all over the world from a backward colonial policy. So Roosevelt and Churchill had a very different outlook for what the post-war world would be like. Roosevelt pointed towards U.S. policy towards the Philippines, which had the planned independence from the United States um, on schedule and along the way, full-on development. He contrasted that with Churchill's idea of maintaining the British Empire. So when the Bretton Woods Conference occurred, compromises were made. Roosevelt did not really get what he wanted in setting up the purpose and mission of the what we'd call today the Bretton Woods Institutions, the IMF, and what we call today the World Bank, or the Bank for Reconstruction and Development. These institutions were intended under Roosevelt's idea, to assist with development, to give loans at reasonable interest rates, and only to give loans, the World Bank was only to give loans that would expand the productivity of a nation. It wasn't to pay off past debt. Use these loans as capital investments to grow. Now, unfortunately, Roosevelt died. Um, the post-war world was not what he would have hoped. We would not have had the Cold War, which was an unnecessary uh, conflict in many ways had Roosevelt survived rather than Truman coming in. And I think that what we have today is an opportunity to address some of these errors in the original creation of the Bretton Woods in 44, which system was partially broken down in 1971. In fact, in large part, 
We still have the IMF and the World Bank, but a major aspect of the Bretton Woods agreements was for long-term stability for development through a fixing of exchange rates between nations. After the British did some shenanigans in the 60s with the value of their pound, Nixon took the dollar off of a gold um, a gold, uh, a gold value in 1971, leading to the floating of all currencies, such that today, every day, there's over $5 trillion of currency trades that take place, and a very small portion, less than 2%, is actually related to currency trading for companies or individuals or institutions that will actually be making trade and requiring the currencies for international trade. Most of it is pure speculation. So the Schiller Institute is calling for uh, the United States, Russia, China, India to come together to be the initiators of a new Bretton Woods conference to make sure that we are able to go beyond the very productive regional projects, excuse me, regional initiatives that you've mentioned, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the BRICS nations, which has set up the New Development Bank. These are, are good and they're actually providing some useful, I might say, competition to the IMF and the World Bank. But let's go all the way and rethink and recreate, as it were, these Bretton Woods institutions and the Bretton Woods system itself. Let's return to a stability of exchange rates. Let's turn away from financial speculation as a growing portion of world economy and invest instead and orient our policies and our economic systems towards physical economic development based on what we all have in common as human beings, our ability to discover how nature works and use that improved knowledge to improve our living standards and improve our ability to learn even more, which today I would think points us towards research on nuclear fusion and on space as areas of potential really wonderful um, returns and of a great potential for international cooperation. You know, one thing I like about um, the work that you do, uh, that the use what you speak about, write about, as well as the Schiller Institute, is uh, you guys uh, offer a lot of solutions. You're very optimistic, which is good, and which is what we need. Um, and you know, I'm also going to ask about the worst case scenario because uh, Graham Allison recently put out a best-selling book, Thucydides' Trap where he looks at 16 past uh, empires and where 12 of them, 12 of the 16 went to war, four did not as one empire declined and the new uh, powers rose. And so you mentioned this new Bretton Woods, which we all hope for. Um, we, we hope that we are in a situation where uh, it'll be a peaceful transition, but and I, I like to ask this question to all of my guests because I think e each of you, the experts, you have your own area of research and you have perhaps a glimpse, a glimmer of the truth, uh, an insight that perhaps a new insight that you might give us from your area of work. Um, what What is, uh, if things go awry, what do you think worst case scenario that can happen? Can we have a wider war? Well, the worst case scenario is indeed terrible. Um, you mentioned the optimistic view of the Schiller Institute, of its founding president, Helga Tsepp-LaRouche. It's true. We have an optimistic outlook. But that is not one where it's a, sort of a view that this is definitely going to happen. This is not definitely going to happen. There is no guarantee that we're going to have a successful new Bretton Woods. There is no guarantee that things will go the right way. The worst case scenario is that which is being promoted by the same types of people who were um, trying to call into question the election of President Trump based on the idea that Russia actually you know, ran the election or Russia hacked the election or various ways that this is being phrased. This is what's the political view of people inside the United States guided by a really British outlook that there can only be one hegemon on this planet and that the supremacy of the quote unquote special relationship existing between the United Kingdom and the United States must be maintained as the dominant force on the planet. That is an untenable view. That is an imperial view. You mentioned Graham Allison's um, well-received book on the Thucydides trap. 
where rising empires rarely in a peaceful way overcome or overtake currently existing ones. That is a true study insofar as it is discussing empire. And I think that the time has come for us to really move beyond geopolitics and no longer necessarily see another's gain as our loss. I think that this is a major shift in outlook. If we do not make this shift in outlook, we are facing the threat of war with Russia and with China, most directly with Russia, but China is seen very strongly by military planners as a major threat. The recent withdrawal from the INF Treaty, the um, Intermediate uh, uh, Weapons Treaty, this is a potential danger, the expansion of NATO. If you take a look at the recent speeches by both um, Merkel at the um, European Parliament and then Macron in, in France at the celebration of the end of World War I, both of those leaders, Merkel and Macron, spoke about the need for a European army, or in Macron's case, a European empire. Now, how does this sound to Russia? If you have Germans talking about creating a European army, I think Russians have some experience with that um, in the past. The real threat is military conflict with Russia, which could spiral very rapidly into becoming nuclear and could quite literally mean the end of human civilization. The stakes could not be higher. Just imagine if there had been some mishap between American and Russian bombers or jet fighters operating in Syria. If a U.S. jet shot down a Russian a Russian um, Air Force's plane, where could that go? How quickly could that escalate? Where could that move to? So the dangers are very great. I believe that it's unnecessary to have the outlook in which these dangers exist, but they do. And it is a question of really overcoming this in my view, very antiquated geopolitical view with a much more adult and forward-looking orientation. And I think it's very important that we achieve those changes in these, um, in the, uh, among the policymakers in the United States, in Europe, uh, but that really it's very urgent that we get the United States to see its international role more along the lines of what Franklin Roosevelt envisaged or as uh, Lyndon LaRouche intended in his runs for the presidency. I think that that's really crucial if we're going to avoid the threat of a potentially globally catastrophic and thermonuclear conflict. My final question is about the economy. Um, what just briefly, you know, what's I think we all know, we all see what's what's happening uh, and what's briefly your prognosis of this spent uh, economic model that is in is in its debt throes how much longer can the debt continue to be papered over and you know just what's your idea of what will happen when the bubble bursts well it really could burst any day you know people many people were very surprised in 2007 2008 with the global financial crisis at that time they had no need to be surprised it wasn't a, it actually wasn't a surprise but today the levels of corporate debt for example are at least 50% higher than they were back at that time. We're in a more precarious situation than we were at the time of the 2007-2008 financial crisis. So if we do not have in place the mechanisms to unwind this very complex and speculative-based system, um, we could see absolute chaos unleashed with a financial crisis. That's why it's really crucial that we implement Lyndon LaRouche's four economic views, in my, in my view, in the United States, that we put in place Glass-Steagall again to have a separation between commercial banking, which is, should be stable and protected, and investment banking, where if investment banks have made losses, uh, then that's just too bad. And if they have to go through bankruptcy, that's okay. It's an orderly way to write down debt that simply cannot be handled. This is something that's done in history repeatedly in the world. There was recently a program to forgive um, debt, to write off debt among um, heavily indented poor countries, the, the HIPAA program. This occurs. It's something that has to occur in the 
Western financial sector. So I think we have to have in place Glass-Steagall to separate the financial type of economy from the more physical economy. We need national credit institutions able to provide credit for programs that will increase physical productivity. And we need to have our sights set on specific scientific and technological projects that will provide the basis for the next level of human advancement. We can currently eliminate poverty in the world. We have the technologies to do this. But if we want to move on to the next level and have a whole new relationship to raw materials, to energy, to space, we need to develop nuclear fusion. And uh, so I think there's a combination between having systems in place to provide stability and uh, financing in the, in the right kinds of directions, accompanied with some very specific long-term or maybe I should say major goals to move the human species forward. All right. And finally, how can people best follow you uh, and the work that you do? Um, well, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is Jason A underscore Ross, R-O-S-S. And the Schiller Institute is online at Schiller Institute altogether. Dot com. That's Schiller, S-C-H-I-L-L-E-R, institute.com. On the front page there, you'll find information about this call that we have put out for a new Bretton Woods and the opportunity to learn more about that. And if you are so inclined to sign up to learn more and to assist in making it a reality. I hope people uh, carefully examine the Belt and Road, the counterpunch by the Anglo-American establishment, uh, and definitely check out the Schiller Institute. There's some uh, excellent uh, analysis going on uh, there. I remember it's about a decade ago when I was in graduate school in Switzerland that I was first uh, introduced to uh, the Executive Intelligence Review and, and Lyndon LaRouche's analysis. So very fascinating stuff. Uh, and thank you again, Jason. Hey, thank you very much.